Welcome to Let's Unpack That. It's a podcast where we two college grads analyze things that we read in middle school from literary and sociopolitical perspectives. I am mad this week. Why are you mad this week? Because I hate this book. I'm so angry at myself that I didn't just open with, hi, mad, I'm dad. Anyway, I'm also Lydia. Oh, I'm Nina. Yeah, so I hate the book. Okay, you hate the book. Everything is getting angsty and teenagery. Of course. I, I am just increasingly peeved by the amount of power that the vampires have in here. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. Okay, all right. Could it be just that you're mad at the capitalist society that we live in and you are currently equating the vampires to that capitalist society as they are reaping in the benefits while the rest of us smolder? I mean, I I hadn't thought of it like that, but uh, if you see the vampires as representing the 1%, then yes, that's a valid reason I would hate them. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Just... Actually, let's explore that. Let's unpack that idea. Vampires as the uh, let's capitalist idea. captains of the world. So, so, so let's just let's just backtrack here. We're reading chapters nineteen and twenty. Uh, we did have that whole blow up there with James, Laurent, and Victoria arriving on the scene. James is turning into psycho, creepy tracker dude, um, and is hunting down Bella as we speak. For those of you who are reading along, hope you read this week. There's a test coming up. Go ahead, Lydia. Yeah, there's a test at the end of the book. It's an accelerated reader advanced level, and you will fail it. Did you know I failed the first Harry Potter book accelerated reader class test? Did you really? How did you do that? Yeah, I did, because I read it at night before bed under my covers, and so I didn't remember as much, and I was like... Half of my mind was panicking that my dad would come in and find me reading under the covers with a flashlight. So I could never really concentrate on it. Oh, the good old days. I was never secretive about my night reading. I kept my light on and my parents would come in and say, go to bed. And I'd look at them back defiantly and say, okay. And then I wouldn't go to bed. (laughs) I was never secretive about it. See, my dad had to wake me up in the morning. And so Mm -hmm. uh, he was not cool with me reading up late at night. Because then I would be harder mm-hmm. to wake up in the morning. <laughs> but also, I shared a room with my sister. See, see, and here the thing is, is that my dad was always responsible for getting me up in the morning, especially in high school. And here's how I would know when it was time to get up. Because in the in, in, when I was in high school, I lived downstairs in the basement. So my dad would come to the foot of the stairs, call my name, and say, like, Nina, get up. And I'd be like, okay, come back 20 minutes later. Nina, get up. Okay. Uh, He'd walk halfway down the stairs, lean over the banister. Nina, get up. Okay. I wouldn't get up. And then come to the bottom of the stairs, call my name again. I wouldn't get up. Come to the door, call my name. I wouldn't get up. So I knew I was fucked if I ever got to the point where he was coming in, opening the door, turning on my light, and coming to my bed and shaking me awake. (laughs) That's when I knew I'd crossed the line. (laughs) But up until then, I was home free. See, my dad would just march in turn on the light and shout good morning <laughs> <laughs> and, how and oftentimes that? would also sing hmm. and that of course also shook me awake because that wasn't enough but we're adults now we don't have bedtimes no we don't i go to bed at 9 30 whether i want to and no i definitely always want to <laughs> it just doesn't end up that way oh it's 10 30 for me all right, so anyway, vampires as capitalists, go. So let's let's think about the captains of industry and the people who inherited mm-hmm. the wealth of the captains of industry. Mm-hmm. It's an inherent thing. It's a bloodline similar to the way that the vampire characteristics are a blood thing. They have everything mm-hmm. they could ever want physically. Right. So like those who have inherited wealth, they have they could buy anything that they want. If they have enough wealth, Mm -hmm. similarly, the vampires can run as fast as they want, can leap as high as they want, can catch anything they want. Uh, They can't be killed by anything other than another vampire. So, like, just make friends, I guess. And they're just, Mm -hmm. uh, they're invincible in every single way. Like, you can't touch them. The law can't touch them because they're too fast and too sneaky. Similar to mm-hmm. people paying to get their kids into college. What? What? 
Lori Laughlin? What? Did you hear she only got it like a couple months or something? Oh, I know. Fuck that. Yeah. It's probably because she paid for her lawyer to go to law school. Oh, she she definitely gave her lawyer a hefty sum. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you become a lawyer, Nina, please just, just do it to help people. <laughs> And I, I know you I will. will. I will. But it's like, they're they're untouchable. They're invincible. And us lowly plebeians and uh, proletariats are just uh, sitting around waiting to be eaten. <laughs> so let's back away from that now. <laughs> no, no. Because I want to tell you about this article that I just found. Um, I don't know quite what to say. It's called Twilight's Lesson, Vampires and Government Suck. Oh. <gasps> It was published on June 4th, 2014 on Pan Am Post. It was written by Frank Worley Lopez. And I swear to God, I just typed in Twilight Vampires as Capitalists, and this is what I found. I'll just read this aloud to you because I'm not good at paraphrasing, but uh, while Stephanie Meyer may not have intended it, the movie has a secondary meaning slash book. Teaching children to love but blood-sucking vampires, a.k.a. the government. Not just any government, though. Big government and communism. How else can you explain the love of big government, socialism, and communism, but to compare it to the love of a vampire? He may suck animal blood, but he's hot and he means well. Oh, and then they spelled Miss Edward. They misspelled Edward's name. Edward's family is made up of supposedly good vampires. Sure, they and their ancestors may have sucked blood in the past, but that's all behind them. Now they only suck on animal blood to survive. Governments like vampires suck the very lifeblood out of people and nations. It has done so for centuries. I think you're uh, you're reading a far right article. I am, and it's hilarious. Okay, just making sure that, that you do that. <laughs> no. N- <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm reading it. I'm like, oh my god, this is a goal. It, it's this is. I'm taking this as a parody. Like, I don't. This is not how I feel. These opinions here that I read from this article are not ones that I share. So, can we also backtrack here a brief minute? Here, here's where we fail at making podcasts coherently. Just here. Just here. The one thing that I wanted to go ahead and correct was that last time we talked, last time we spoke, um, in regards to our last conversation, I mentioned that there was a vampire who turned Alice who worked for or worked within the asylum that her parents had locked her up in. Um, and I couldn't figure out why he did that and why whether or not like maybe this was another good vampire, quote unquote good, who was only drinking the blood of animals. As it turns out, I was incorrect. I went ahead and rechecked my sources there. And essentially what it was was, was a nameless vampire who was working within the asylum uh, because essentially all the people who were in the asylum were forgotten. Therefore, he had access to many hundreds of humans that no one would miss once they died. Um, and that's why he was assimilating in as a worker within the asylum. Uh, because then uh, he could have access to all of those people and no one would miss them if he accidentally sucked them dry. And what's kind of interesting about that is, you know, he we're presuming there that he had red eyes, but no one would mention his red eyes because they're in an insane asylum. So if the patients were saying that they saw him with red eyes, they would be assumed to be like t- going crazy. And then none of the none of the other people who worked in the asylum would say that he had red eyes because no one else had said it. And they they didn't want to seem like they were crazy. It's all kind of brilliant and genius in in a way. Anyway, thank you, Nameless Vampire, for that. And that has been my correction. Thank you. Really brings to light the negligence in old-timey mental institutions. Oh, let's not open this box. It's still happening. I know. Also, I wanted to point out that, you know, I don't really think people give Charlie enough credit here. Because when, when Edward and Bella are driving home... After James sets out on the hunt there, they're kind of talking about their different plans in terms of what to do and how to fix this and then how to not get Charlie killed. Bella points out that if essentially she disappeared and then the next day he, you know, Edward's family disappeared, that that Charlie would know something or at least suspect something. She hints that he's not an idiot. But I feel like they do treat him like he's an idiot a lot of the time, which is kind of sad. But then also thinking about it, I don't think the book gives enough credit to Charlie for being the local police chief. Like, 
obviously nothing much happens in Forks, but when it does happen, Charlie's the first guy on the scene, you know, in terms of missing people, murder cases, he's at it. He's not just this fishing, mustachioed, basketball-loving dad. He is the literal head of the police force within the small town, and so of fucking course he would be looking for his daughter if she suddenly disappeared, and it would be dumb for them, for them to think, oh, okay, well, he won't ever find her. Maybe not, but he would drive himself crazy looking for her, and that's something that they need to consider. So I guess my point being that if, you know, if she suddenly left and the Carlisles were gone too, it would look way too suspicious, and Charlie would definitely hunt for answers. Whether or not he would find them is up to the vamps, but uh, that is definitely something that I've thought about here within the past couple days, realizing, wait a minute, Charlie is the literal head of police. He is the investigator for all of these crazy things that happen. People need to give him more credit. Yeah. Team Charlie. I think he has the potential to be a badass help to the vampires. Like, mm-hmm. they do not utilize him at all. Like, we're talking about chapter 19 now. So chapter 19 is the, the chapter where Bella returns to her house and absolutely crushes Charlie's little heart uh, in order mm-hmm. to run away and get protected by the vampires. Um, so she goes to the Cullen house with Edward where... Uh, Laurent still is. Laurent leaves. Uh, He's not going to get involved. Esme switches clothes with Bella in a really weird scene. And then the escape ensues with Bella in the Mercedes with Alice and Jasper headed south on the way to Phoenix. Several points here. Uh, Why did she have to absolutely crush Charlie? That just devastated me like is he gonna forgive her after this is he gonna believe that she wants to come back after this like what the fuck you couldn't have done this without involving your mom and how she like totally just left him because she's a flighty person you aren't your dad's wife and he doesn't deserve this well i mean i think the reason's fairly obvious she didn't she didn't want him following her And, you know, trying to convince her to come back. She didn't mean any of what she said. And she, I think she hated herself the whole time she was saying it. But, you know, she needed to really break his heart. That way he would not come find her. Because at that point, she doesn't know when she'll see him again. She might not come back. She needs to break his heart. That way he'll stay away. Then why did she tell him where she was going? I thought the whole point was protecting Charlie by not telling him where she's going so that the the evil vampire can't question him. And now, what is the point? The evil vampire can question him and he'll be able to say, oh, Bella's in Phoenix because that's where she actually is. Like, that's that's really, really stupid. Also, she says, I could think of only one way to escape. Whoa, let's think again before you hurt someone who absolutely, like, loves you and who you love. And just just take a step back for a second. At least, at least, tell him you're going to Phoenix and don't go to Phoenix. Because you're just (laughs) leaving a trail. And, like, you're really leading the evil vampire to Charlie because he has information. And accurate information. Which is, ah, ah, ah. I want to know... Does Charlie ever find out that Edward is a vampire? He does not know. No, he does not. What he, the fuck? He knows that there's something weird going that he does not ever find How out. How does he no. reconcile the fact that his grandchild is a day old one day and seven years old the next? Oh, that's because Jacob transforms in front of him into a werewolf and they kind of just like gloss over that part. It's really wonderful writing on the part of Meyer. And distracts him from his grandchild? No, basically says there's stuff here that you don't know about. And essentially Charlie goes, I don't want to know. Ah, fuck that. He's a police chief. He's a detective. He should investigate. You know. Uh I know. I know. I hate this so much. I'm sorry. I hate this so much. (laughs) No, I've always hated that. I always hated that they kind of glossed over Charlie potentially knowing what's going on. It always felt like really lazy writing. Yeah, it is lazy. He's not even an idiot. He's just not a character. He's just a cardboard Mm -hmm. cutout of a football-loving, fishing-loving, police, old-fashioned man. Mm -hmm. This here's my town. This town ain't big enough for the two of us, Edward. (laughs) Clearly. Also, Edward is so sure that he'll forgive her. Like, will he? Does Charlie forgive her? 
I mean, yeah, she she comes back with him and he definitely forgives her. Like, absolutely. Does she get grounded in any way? No, because he doesn't know how to act like her dad. Like, for you and I, we, we've been around our dads our whole lives and, like, backsassing them either ended up with being grounded, sent to our room, or slapped in the face. But with Charlie, he's only seen uh, Bella through little snippets throughout her growing up. Suddenly she's an adult, so he doesn't know how to be a parent to her. All he's seen are these little chunks of time where he has, you know, seen her kind of like, bloop, 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 grow up, and then suddenly, bam, she's an adult. So, you know, because she's only been in his life for a little bit, uh, and, you know, once she gets there, she starts acting like an adult. She does the grocery shopping, she does the cooking, she does the cleaning. You know, she's been acting like an adult the whole time. In our situations, you know, our dads would fight us fight us, um, and try to keep us from driving off in the middle of the night. But Charlie, aside from being hurt and bewildered, wouldn't know any better because this whole time she's presented herself as this older adult person and he doesn't know he doesn't know how to parent her. That's been evident this entire time. He just does not know. Like he he loves her. But what would he say at that point anyway that would make her stay like, oh, please stay. I'll take care of you. Like, no, she's been taking care of him the whole time. I, I don't see I don't see there would ever be a situation where she wouldn't get grounded or anything like that because that's just not how their relationship works. See, I disagree. I think at the point where she says, I'm leaving in the middle of the night, I'm taking my truck and I'm driving from Washington State to Arizona by myself as a lone girl on the road at night. At that point, police chief needs to kick in. And I think police chief Charlie would kick in and say, no, that's not safe. You're staying here or you're staying somewhere safe. I don't think he would punish her for leaving. I think that's that's totally like reasonable. He's not going to punish her for leaving. But I think he would enforce some sort of boundary when it comes to her keeping herself safe from his perspective, because he is in law enforcement and because he knows what happens on the roads at night. He knows the area. He knows that there have been murders slash bear attacks. And he knows what bears can do to a car door. Because he knows that, I feel like Police Chief Swan needs to kick in right now. And it would be characteristic for that to happen. But it doesn't because Charlie isn't a character. Like, it's not even a case of him being a dad. It's him being an authority in the community. That's true. But I also feel like it's different when it's your own child and when they've said those hurtful things to them, to you. True. And then we're back to the hurtful things, which like, ouch. Well, and then, and then once we're, once we're in the car after, so let, let's establish, okay, Bella does a really terrible thing. We got that. But then once she and Edward are in the car driving away from the bloodbath that she's leaving in her wake, Edward actually says to her, if you didn't smell so appallingly luscious, he might not have bothered, referring to James deciding to track her. I almost threw the book at this point. What about you? Oh, I we, we've established long ago that I hate how much her smelling good and her smelling like good food is mentioned. I've said this before, Edward, you just want to fuck a sandwich. Like, But ah. I just love how he's uh, victim blaming her here. It's like, well, if you hadn't been having, if you hadn't had on that particular scent of blood on you, then James wouldn't have tried to kill you. So this is your fault. He's trying to flirt here and it's not why, working. Why would he flirt with her now? Like, why? Because he's What's still establishing that he finds her attractive and that he wants to save her. Reed, save her for himself. Nah. <laughs> do you Do you remember that uh, short story, The Most Dangerous Game? No, I really don't. And I was wondering if you could explain it to me. It's a short story that I read, I think, in middle school or early high school. And basically, the most dangerous game is a bunch of people are brought to an island, and this one guy likes to hunt big game. And it's gradually revealed that his latest thrill is hunting people, because they're equal to him in strength and intelligence, and therefore are more matched prey uh and so mm -hmm. uh people have to run away from him and huh. beat his game hello wealthy hot people let's play a murder game let's play murder can we talk about power absolutely please yeah. do so in this chapter it says the only way to be sure that a vampire is dead is to tear him to shreds and then burn the pieces 
And my first thought was, well, fuck, that throws all of my Buffy dreams out of the window. (laughs) And because I'm in that mood, we're going to talk about this. Let's do it. Let's have some discourse. Are you kidding me? The only way to kill them is basically if a bunch of them gang up on one of their own and rip them to shreds and burn the pieces because that's the only way to do it. Humans aren't capable of that. They would all die Mm -hmm. in a second because vampires are so overleveled in everything. It's like sending a level 20 of every single class into a battle with a poor baby goblin. Like, that baby goblin is going to die. That's true. Oh my god. They are the top apex predator. And it's supposed to be sexy. It's not sexy. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, okay. So let's see. Let's talk about power. So vampires have too much fucking power. Mm -hmm. So my questions are, why is all of humanity not dead by now? Uh, why keep the secret if there's almost no way for them to die? And why not just overrun the earth and enslave humanity for food? Hmm. And now we're back to capitalism. They just have so much power that they could achieve that 1% status in the Mm -hmm. world. I did some research on power and at what point people might stop desiring power. And is, is there a point to trying to achieve power? I found an article in The Atlantic called People Want Power Because They Want Autonomy. And it summarizes a study from 2016 that suggests that people want autonomy power more than influence power and the influence type of power doesn't satisfy the need for autonomy which is why they strive for more and more of the influence to fill that gap wait pause explain the difference between the two So autonomy is power over self so Mm -hmm. the ability to make your own decisions and i think to make your own decisions and not stigmatize yourself from the inside um so like freedom from yourself as well as freedom from outside forces Mm -hmm. And influence power is like money and wealth and fame and political power, stuff like that. Right. So in this study, they found that most people wanted to be in environments where they had autonomy, more personal freedom, than they had influence over other people if either one made them sacrifice the other. That made me question, what is autonomy in the Twilight universe and who has it? Mm Mm-hmm. Because they who have autonomy apparently have the best form of power. The most personally satisfying form of power. Okay. I think the vampires are constrained by social standards, but not really because they're beautiful and all-powerful. They're constrained by their accursedness, but really that's a perceived thing, an internal thing that they could work through. Mm -hmm. So do they have autonomy? I mean, yes, But I think they impose restrictions on their own autonomy for the sake of their internal biases and internalized stigmas. But because they have superpowers, they they are in charge of themselves. It's only their internal biases that are keeping them from just doing anything. Okay. That brought me to the question, does Bella have autonomy? Mm -hmm. And by extension, is she empowered? In this case, Bella is maybe less constrained by her own biases in her head and more constrained by physical things and by external forces she isn't like the vampire she isn't all powerful and she Mm -hmm. perceives the external physical power as the epitome of autonomy and therefore as the epitome of power and maybe that's why she wants to become a vampire because she doesn't really have power over her own life and she's kind of established that she doesn't you know, she organizes and she cleans and she has to keep everything just so. Aside from all of that, really, what has she had control over? You know, she's a, the child of a divorced home. Um, her mother remarried, who and her mother is said to be very erratic and, you know, scatterbrained. So definitely, if she's searching for that autonomy, I, I would believe it. Because she really doesn't have control over much else in her life. Interesting. So there's my rant about power we've talked about this before how edward so vastly overpowers bella physically and like he claims emotionally Mm -hmm. so we can talk more about that later because it it ties in with one of your later points yeah kind of does chapter 20 uh we could go on to chapter 20 but before that esme tells bella to be safe i know and it's so sweet imagine how many times she said that the all of the 
gang as they're going out hunting, you know, just be safe and come back in one piece. And Bella's tra- and Edward's transmitting that to Bella. That's really sweet. He writes that on page 249. All right, so chapter 20. Yes. After their great escape from Forks, and actually, I wanted to point this out. I don't think the plan was established when she was telling Charlie uh, that she was leaving. I think she said that she was going to Phoenix because that was the first place that came to mind, and obviously it makes the most sense. But I don't think the idea of going to Phoenix was truly established until they got to the Cullens' house. I I think the idea was floated around, but... You know, essentially, Bella says, I'll tell him I'm going home to Phoenix and then you guys take me wherever you want. And then later they're like, "Okay, yeah, let's take her to Phoenix. So essentially in chapter 20, after that whole kind of rundown, Bella wakes up in the hotel room in Phoenix with Alice and Jasper. um, And she remembers driving south with them and coming to the hotel and that they're essentially now just waiting. Uh, They're waiting to see what's going to happen next, waiting to hear anything back from the rest of the family, blankly watching TV like so many of us did in high school. And then Bella asks Alice how someone would become a vampire, which is interesting because Edward told Alice not to tell her, but she does it anyway in kind of vague terms. And then we have some more action picking up with Alice having a vision of James in the ballet studio. And I have to say, reading these scenes again, I remember for some reason these are sticking out so prominently in my mind as being very familiar from when I was a kid. Uh, So it almost feels like going home to a really shitty old friend, like one that you're better off not having, but still there and still gives you some kind of warmth. Yeah, I found the part, it's actually in chapter 18, where they establish that she's going to Phoenix. She says, hang out here for a week, a few days, let Charlie see you haven't kidnapped me and lead this James on a wild goose chase, make sure he's completely off my trail, then come and meet me, da 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 da, I could see him beginning to consider it, meet you where, Phoenix, of course, no, he'll hear that's where you're going, Mm. he said impatiently. And you'll make it look like that's a ruse, obviously. He'll know that we'll know he's listening. He'll never believe I'm actually going where I say I'm going. Um, And I don't know how he's not currently listening to their conversations now. But, um, you know, for the sake of the action within the book, I concede. All right. That, that's a risk, though. Yeah, that is a risk. Because, I mean, I wouldn't put it past Charlie to go after her. I mean, I wouldn't put it past James to actually, like... Oh, she told her dad that she was going to Phoenix. I mean, of course she's going to Phoenix. It's logically the place that she's going to run to. Yeah. But yeah, uh, Bella pulls this none of his business thing again, this time with Edward, about what Edward is. <laughs> Isn't that his business? Kind of his business. Just a bit. She's she's really going for this. Yeah, she really is. I found out that Carlisle is the inspiration for the Stregoni Benefici uh, the, quote, good vampire that we learned about sometime early in the book when Bella was first researching vampires and saw that there was some kind of Italian vampire mm-hmm. uh, that was meant to be good. That was Carlisle. Oh. They're referring to one single vampire. Oh. Um, and that was because during his time while he was living with the Volturi, he was kind and did not hunt the rest of the humans, that there there began rumors swirling of a good vampire within the Volterra city And that is where the idea of the good vampire comes from. So he revealed himself to humans before. Well, I think it had something to do with the fact that he probably fought on their behalf and maybe somehow word got out about it or something like that. I I, I don't necessarily know how that works out, but that's something that was established in the Twilight Guide. Well, I mean, Carlisle does say go in peace. In chapter 19. Well, he is Jesus. We have established that. Peace be with you. And also with you. Or is it and also with your spirit? They changed it recently. Oh, did they really? How do you... What? By recently, I mean the Catholic like Church? a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't what? know. Ask John Mulaney. That's how I got this information. Peace be with you and also with your... What? No. Peace be with you and also with you. That's like a... It's like a... Oh, have a nice day. Thanks, you too. Come on. You can't change the Catholic Church. They've been around for eons. That's what we learned at Pepperdine. Early church history time. Religion 102. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot in that class. I learned more in 101. I wish I'd had Willis for my 102 class. Oh. I feel like I would have learned a lot more. See, I didn't learn anything in 101 because I'd grown up with those stories. Oh, see, I, I didn't know anything. I was coming from a non-church going family and I was like, this is fucking awesome. I can't wait to hear about it. 
Education. Education. It works. That's what we do. You're in a cult. Call your dad. What is that from? That is from My Favorite Murder. Oh, <laughs> And okay. coincidentally, we're recording this on a Tuesday. On Thursday, I will be going to see my darling My Favorite Murderinos, Karen Kilgariff and Georgia Hardstark, and hopefully Stephen Ray Morris, as they do a live podcast show in Oklahoma City. So that is where I'm going to be this weekend. All I am right. so pumped because, again, if I'm going to shamelessly plug any kind of podcast at all, it, w- it, <laughs> it would be my favorite murder because I love them. They're so funny. They talk about true crime, but in a way that's also kind of like, hey, life sucks, but here's how we're going to deal with it. And it's, it's just a beautifully made podcast. And I love them and I appreciate them. And Elvis is perfect. Thank you. Several events have been in my area lately, but I've been busy and tired. Uh, So a couple weeks ago, my brother, my brother and me and the Adventure Zone were in San Francisco or San Jose, maybe. But I didn't go because I was tired and had stuff to do. (laughs) And then last weekend, Kitten Lady was in town. She was in You didn't go see Kitten Lady? No, I didn't because I, oh man, I, I was just so tired. I spent all of Saturday literally listening to the Adventure Zone and playing Stardew Valley and eating Frosted Mini Wheats. Girl. And it was wonderful. It was exactly what I I'm sure it was, but so would have been seeing Hannah Shaw. Yeah. She'll she'll be in NorCal again. Also, everybody follow Kitten Lady and donate to Orphan Kitten Club. I am a a monthly donation or er, er, monthly donator donor. uh, for the Orphan Kitten Club donor. Donor. <laughs> Mon- I really need to stop recording this podcast now. I'm very tired. No, we just need to do it earlier in the day. Yes. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, so Bella finally calls her mom, which is why you said call your dad, you're in a cold. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh man, geez, I just, uh, thinking about this again, like here I go, I'm on this constant spiral of digging myself out of this i don't know shallow grave of twilight Mm -hmm. that i keep falling into Mm -hmm. and then i just fall back into it again and edward and bella just cover me with dirt all over again there's no logic there's no sense there's no escaping them charlie is probably so worried if he has any shred of sense in him he'll have state troopers on it because she is a minor and she is crossing state lines possibly with other Mm non-minors and she is alone that's a good point does he do that ladies and gentlemen no he does not because that would mean making the story too complicated yeah and what do we say here lazy writing only oh man i just oh i feel so bad for charlie still like she should have called him immediately when she got to phoenix saying at least oh she should have at least saying hey i'm safe oh definitely i'm not arguing that send him an email or a text saying i'm safe dad i'm not a dad i'm not even a dad and i'm spiraling i know and and this doesn't sound anything like you spiraling over anyone else's problems definitely not but while we're on the, the topic of Bella and doing everything, you know, she does think that she's protecting him. Uh, she thinks that any contact with him will be his death sentence. And that if she does call him, um, she'll, he'll demand to know where she is, what she's doing, and he might even come after her. In Bella's mind, contact with her is dangerous. And this kind of relates back to how we were talking about autonomy and power, but it also kind of has to do a little bit with self-blame. And I think actually it's showing really her age here because she's really putting a lot of blame on herself. She's blaming herself for putting the Collins in danger, uh, first off. But the thing is, they've never they've never been in danger. This whole time, she was the one who was in danger. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if something happens to them, it'll be my fault. You know, that's what she's thinking about time after time. She's like, oh, my God, it's going to be my fault. Oh, my God, it's my fault. When really there is no plausible way that that James could, you know, reasonably overpower all of them. Like you said, it's seven against one. You know, yeah. they're, you know, he he's going to die. There's no there's no reason where this doesn't happen. And she's also forgetting the fact that a sadistic vampire is literally stalking her and causing this. He won't listen to reason. He won't stop to negotiate. And this is in no way her fault. You know, this is this is not something that she's brought upon herself. You know, Edward is the one who invited her to the baseball game, first of all. And second of all, James is the one who's being so feral and crazy that they can't even talk to him out of, you know, not hunting her down. So, you know, on top of all of this, Edward has pursued her the entire time. 
You know, he brought her into this life. She can blame herself all that she wants, but she isn't the only responsible party. Um, you know, Edward is the one who has been pursuing her, following her, ends up telling her all of the things about the vampires and essentially brings her into this life. So in a way, I think it's a little bit more his fault. But, you know, despite all of those three facts, you know, those factors going into this, Bella's still blaming herself. And this really shows, I think, a level of teenage immaturity that shows the crack in her veneer. You know, Bella's a kid, plain and simple. She's a teenager and who's acting very impulsively. Uh, she's self-blaming herself because who didn't blame themselves for every world problem when they were in high school? And then she thinks she has all the answers, which is definitely something that I thought of uh, when when I was 17, thought I could take on the world by myself. How hell fucking no was I wrong? Uh, but, you know, she she's 17. She thinks she has all the answers. She thinks that she's doing what's best for everybody else, which is how we see the events play out later in the book. I, I think I would be more fine with this because the way you frame it, yes, her decisions do make sense in the context that she's in. I would be more fine with it if she experienced any consequences at all for her actions. Literally, the vampires pick up all the slack. Edward has to suck the venom out. She makes a full recovery. I mean, after breaking her fucking leg. That's nothing in the grand scheme of things. She doesn't, like... She doesn't lose a scholarship or uh, get suspended from school or get expelled for missing too many days. Like, nothing of great consequence happens. Like, her dad forgives her um, and isn't holding anything against her in the future or isn't wary of her tendency to be flighty like her mom. I would understand that if she learned anything from any of this. And I don't think that she will. Maybe so. I mean, I would have to agree with that because then we wouldn't have the rest of the book series. While I was looking at this, I did look on Psychology Today and found an article called Self-Blame, How Do You Respond When Things Go Wrong? Um, and what was mostly interesting to me was kind of narrowing down, like, who tends to self-blame? Directly quoting here from the from the article that I found, again, on, on Psychology Today, is uh, researchers suggest that there are several groups of individuals who may maladaptively engage in self-blame for negative events. These include people who suffer from obsessional problems. Check. People who suffer from depression. Check. I don't know if this one applies, but this is definitely an interesting point. Um, it says people who engage in self-blame are individuals who are sexually abused as children, which is a lot. You know, we, we see that a lot. You hear about these cases where kids are like, oh, maybe if I had just kept my own business or if I hadn't been out walking by myself. It's a lot of the we see a lot of the reality of, you know, rape victims blaming themselves, thinking it's their fault. It's something, you know, it's something that we can, you know, do thinking there was some way that we could have prevented these things from happening to us when really there wasn't any way to prevent us. So that's mm -hmm. an interesting thought there. Um, individuals who were sexually abused as children taking on that self blame because, you know, you know, let, let, we'll assume that Bella wasn't as a child, but but still, that's an interesting point to bring up. Well, in a way, she actually, she still is a child. And she that's is true. literally being groomed by a 100-year-old vampire who refers to her as a child. So That's true. So there you go. And then doing a quick roundabout back to the idea of people who suffer from depression, uh, we again kind of see this idea of depression that could relate back to Bella. And the big question is, uh, you know, is she depressed? And I think so. Um, because the the three kind of top things that I noticed from Bella when I kind of looked back over symptoms of depression, and again, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a any kind of mental therapist or mental health professional. This is just what I know off of common knowledge, having been, you know, a subscriber to clinical depression for uh, probably about six years now. In any case, some of the things here that relate back to, you know, signs of depression, Bella exhibits a lot of these behaviors. You know, she isolates from people and from friends. She really is, she doesn't want to be friends with really anyone else. She doesn't try. Um, she thinks of herself as inherently different or boring or uninteresting. She doesn't really think there's anything to be said about her. You know, she, she really doesn't think she's remarkable in any way and has a very negative self image. And then she engages in a dangerous and impulsive behavior, which is definitely something that people who are depressed have, have done before and, you know, do every now and again. That is something that people come up with in order to cope. You know, they'll, they'll try and do something that will get their adrenaline pumping. That way they feel something different than nothing. Um, so definitely I think here we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of the signs pointing to Bella is actually depressed. She just doesn't know it herself. Yeah. And it, it takes time to know. 
I think it is okay that she is doing these things. And I just, again, I just hope that she learns from it. And if she were a real person, I would be like hoping to God that she's okay now. Yeah. And another, another interesting article I found was reasons why girls blame themselves for abusive boyfriends, Um, which I guess, I mean, that could be, that could be gender neutral, why people blame themselves for abusive partners. Um, And essentially the reasons why they might do so is one, internalizing. The abuser may tell his victim that his behavior is her fault rather than taking responsibility for his actions. Isolation from loved ones is, you know, pretty self-explanatory. Essentially, the abuser will get them alone. And then formulative factors such as, you know, how they grew up or something else going on with their development. Bella grew up in a dysfunctional family. She grew up as a mom to her own mother. And that's where we're seeing kind of these other reasons why she might be blaming herself for the things that have happened here with Edward when really it's, it's not her fault. It really isn't. Yeah, fundamentally what I see here is a lack of trust in the relationship. I see it more as concern for the rest of the vampires, but but okay, go on. So Bella doesn't necessarily trust the vampires to keep everybody safe, which is why she takes on the task of planning this whole heist and her escape. She thinks that she'll have the best ideas and that she is best equipped to come up with these ideas. Like she says that, oh, that's a good idea. Well, of course it is. It was my idea. But also Edward doesn't trust Bella to go on with life, uh, which is why he doesn't want uh, Alice to tell her how to become a vampire. Because he doesn't trust her to not put him in a situation where he'll bite her and turn her. And like vice versa, Bella doesn't trust Edward to to let her be what she wants to be. This whole relationship is fucked. I mean, I think we could probably establish that from the get-go. Yeah. We've been viewing this from a very adult perspective this whole time. What do you think this says to middle schoolers? Like, what did it say to us and... Is it nearly as bad as we're perceiving it to be today? I think it's perceiving, it's saying that like, you know, no matter what this person does, as long as they say that they love you, their actions will be excused. And I think that's a very common theme that we see throughout maybe all kinds of media. You know, kids need to be aware of that this is not okay. This is not something that, um, you know, if they keep on apolo- if they keep on apologizing, but then they keep on repeating that behavior, they're not really sorry. They're not trying to make that change. Uh, they're just they're just doing the same thing and hoping that you'll keep forgiving them. Um, and that's probably the most prominent thing that I would I would point out. What about you? In in a lot of ways, this whole book is a wish fulfillment for young girls. You're a teenager. You're awkward in your body. You're kind of depressed. Um, you're going through all these things, and it's nice to have the idea of someone who's steady and strong and going to like keep you safe, but also the drama unchanging. Of- Yeah, unchanging, but also the drama of not being able to know that completely. I get that. I don't relate to it in the form of Bella, Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that's really why teenage girls clung to her, including you, was like to be something more. Right, to be extraordinary. Everything else aside, supernatural things aside, power aside, to be something extraordinary, to be loved for being extraordinary and to be able to become the most extraordinary of extraordinary things. Or just to be loved for yourself and be able to become extraordinary through that. But yeah, um, definitely. Well, I don't even I don't even think it's about embracing yourself. I think it's about gaining some higher thing and being something else. Because like when you're when you're a teenager, you want to escape yourself sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like oftentimes. And it's, this is a sort of escapism that works with that. Right. Like, I don't think it's even telling you to love yourself or that you should be loved for yourself. It's that you should be loved for your extraordinary qualities and you should strive to be more extraordinary in order to be more loved. Right. Which as a subliminal message is like the basic thing that I think is the problem with this book and that maybe as a like 13 year old when I read it I was like not on board with and something that has definitely changed in literature since especially young adult literature a lot more about accepting yourself and being yourself and not needing anybody else to save you or to tell you you're extraordinary all right (laughs) feeling good (sighs) I I feel just a little bit lighter 
<laughs> okay. Maybe. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, do you have a yikes moment for me? All of them. Fuck it. All, All of, of them. them. <laughs> what about you? Um, I just was mad at the point when Rosalie was getting mad at Bella and blaming her for what's going on when it's literally not her fault. Like, the poor girl had nothing to do with this. Your brother's just a creep and there's a sadistic vampire after you. Like, it's it's not it's not Bella's fault. Calm down. Well, this has been fun. Yeah. I feel like <laughs> this has been one of our more straightforward episodes. Like, we jumped right in and we're jumping right out. Yep. Good night, everybody. I'm going to bed. Uh, as always, we're on SoundCloud and on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts. And we're also on Twitter at Let's Unpack Pod. We'll be back in two weeks. <laughs> we'll be back in two weeks, hopefully. Assuming I don't sleep through the next two weeks. Yeah, you might. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, do it for the vamps. <laughs>